for change, but so can you. So can you. Vamos a continuar con nuestro programa del, del día de hoy, en el tercer eh, día de webinars para Latin Scan. And so now it's uh, the turn of Professor Fernanda Duarte from Oxford University. It is a, a pleasure for me to introduce her. Uh, it's uh, also a pleasure for me to have worked with her in the organization of the computational chemistry section of uh, Latin Scan. So if I may, I'm going to read a, a, a short um, um, introduction. Uh, Professor Fernando Duarte uh, obtained her PhD in chemistry from the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile in 2012. Her PhD research focused on the formulation of theoretical frameworks to characterize chemical processes by employing density functional theory and hybrid quantum mechanics molecular mechanics approaches. During her PhD, she was granted a Fulbright Scholarship at Duke University and the L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Award. In 2013, she was also invited to the Lindau Nobel Laureate Meeting, receiving a fellowship from the Burt and Kugi Valley Foundation. After graduating, she joined the Department of Cell and Molecular Biology at Uppsala University in Sweden, where she pursued training in biomolecular modeling. In December 2015, she moved to the University of Oxford with a Royal Society Newton Fellowship working in the area of computational organic chemistry. Professor Duarte joined the School of Chemistry at Edinburgh in January 2017 with a Chancellor's Fellowship. And in October uh, of the following year, 2018, she returned to Oxford and took up for her first faculty appointment as an Associate Professor at the Department of Chemistry. Uh, Professor Duarte has received uh, many accolades, aside from the L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Award, also the pre-doctoral Fulbright Scholarship in 2010, the Marie Curie Career Grant in 2015, the Newton Fellowship in 2015, and the MGMS Frank Blaney Award from the Molecular Graphics and Modeling Society in 2020. So it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here uh, at the Latinx Chem webinars and also as, a, as an organizer. Um, thank you very much. Please go ahead. Perfect. Um, Joaquin, so many thanks for, for the kind introduction and the invitation. It's for me a great pleasure to connect today with all of you and share a bit of the work that we are doing. Um, so what I will be presenting is a very specific project that we have just published and is related to a uh, SARS-CoV-2 MPRO, which you may know for, for different reasons. But before starting uh, to talk about this particular project, I would like to present a part of the work that we are doing because this particular project has been a really a team effort. I by that I meant not only my group, but many different groups around the globe. So before starting discussing this science, I would like to introduce myself and, and my group. So as Joaquin mentioned, I'm originally from Chile, from Santiago, Chile. And I have been in Oxford for the last three years. So I have been very lucky to be joined by an amazing group of, of young scientists shown here. Sadly, we have spent most of the time in lockdown. So two out of three years here has been lockdown, but we have been very lucky 
to return healthy and to be able to meet again after a long period of lockdown. So here we are based in the physical and theoretical chemistry department, which is a very a nice building when you can see sometimes the sun outside. And what we do is mostly computational chemistry. So our research interest mostly uh, lies in chemistry, chemical reactivity and selectivity. And our main goal is to understand how bonds are formed and broken in chemical reactions, going from uncatalyzed reactions in solution to more complex processes in the condensed phase and also in biomolecules. And our approach is very much bottom-up approach where every time that we study a chemical reaction, doesn't matter if it's an enzyme or supramolecular cage, we go to study the fundamental chemistry first and then try to understand how different effects such as solvent or the environment are affecting selectivity and catalysis. In the last three years, we have also been very active in developing computational tools to facilitate the work of our colleagues, experimental colleagues, in designing new supramolecular cages, but also in studying chemical reactions through automation. More recently, we have been also working on machine learning potentials with the final goal of understanding how we can better describe chemical reactions in, in solutions. So our core uh, aim is, is to be able to visualize in a meaningful and quantitative way how chemical reactions happen in the condensed phase. But actually with the lockdown, many things have changed. We may remember early 2020, March 2020, when the pandemic was declared globally. And that meant that our group went into work in virtually most of us. We're very lucky to, to be healthy and to be able to continue work as much as we could um, remotely. But some of us were more affected than others. And uh, Henry shown here and Tristan completely switched the research work from the biomolecular modeling that they were doing at that time to work on research related to COVID. And that came motivated by Chris Schofield and Garrett in, in Oxford. So Chris is in the chemistry department and he really gathered people with different expertises trying to think how we could contribute to the challenges that we were facing. We have excellent chemists, synthetic chemists, medicinal chemists here, and we're trying to contribute from the computational side to those efforts. Garrett, on the other hand, is working in the statistical departments. He has expertise in machine learning, is a chemist by training too, and has been developing many docking tools uh, for inhibitor design. So we decided to bring together uh, our expertise and work on SARS-CoV-2. For me, uh, SARS-CoV-2 was something very new, very complex, but actually for by many uh, for, for many people, including Henry, for example, that came from Hong Kong, he knew from many years ago the, the, the seriousness of this virus. Knowing SARS-CoV and MERS in 2012 and 2002 and 2004. So all these viruses are connected because they belong to the same um, a family of coronaviruses. And they are very interesting because they have a very large and complex genome and are cause the most serious respiratory syndromes, coronaviruses. So today, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 in short, has been uh, affecting all of us in many different ways, sadly killing millions of people. As I mentioned before, before in Asia, uh, there was uh, a lot of research being done in SARS-CoV-1, and that has really helped us to understand uh, uh, the, the implications that a, that virus can have and really push the research that we, we are um, being able to see today. Sadly, many of that research was stopped in 2012 when MERS went, went out and likely disappeared. That was not the situation with SARS-CoV-2, but all the knowledge that has been collected of those coronaviruses um, has been able to help us to tackle the new pandemic. So we didn't know much about this particular virus and actually it's a very complex process as many of the viral replications that we see. So this is a pictorial representation. This has been uh, provided by David uh, Goodsell uh, at the Scripps Institute in the US. And he has provided a cartoon representation of the different stages of the virus. So these are different time uh, snapshots of the viruses trying to mimic the size of the different compartments. 
So inside a cell, a human cell, the virus can enter, can use the chemical machinery that is inside the ribosome to, to use the single genome, generate this double DNA strand and really RNA strand and really generate all the chemical machinery to replicate later. Building the viral, which will later uh, be expelled from the cells to attack new human cells. So this is a very large system. You can see, for example, the spikes, uh, proteins that have been investigated here. And something that is very interesting, as I mentioned before, is the very large and complex genome of this virus, which can go to up to 15 non-natural proteins. And those proteins are essential for replication. You may not see him, uh, those proteins uh, here, but uh, here I would assume in, you can identify those different proteins that are encoded at the very end of the genome of COVID-19. So we're interested in one particular protein. This tiny protein shown here is NSP5, and it's a, a protein that is critical for viral replication. And we're very interested in that protein in particular for several reasons. So you see that the size is, is very, very small compared to the whole complexity of the virus, but actually it's fundamental for replication. What this protein is doing is acting as a scissor. So when these 15 different proteins are generated, 11 of them are generated in a single line. So they are synthesized all together coming from the virus. And what is happening is that this scissor, this is the first one. So NSP5 is the first a set of amino acids in this sequence and cut itself and then start cutting at very specific position, the different proteins that will later um, uh, combine here in this more complex uh, scaffold. So if we can block this protein, then we can uh, stop cutting those different proteins and this machinery, the chemical machinery found here will not be possible. More interestingly, there is no similar human enzyme. So which means that this is a very good target because we don't have any problem of attacking our own uh, proteins. And this is actually similar to the proteins that we have seen uh, um, doing the same uh, uh, task in SARS and in MERS, which means that if we can find uh, targets that can inhibit this protein, this protein, we can attack not only SARS-CoV-1, but also SARS-CoV-2 and maybe new variations to come. We were very much interested in understanding the chemistry of this tiny enzyme, how we could block this tiny enzyme and therefore block a, the a replication of the virus. So we have been studying for a long time a enzymes and we usually start with a crystal structure. So having a crystal is key to have a good modeling of the system. As you can see, this en enzyme is relatively small. It's a homodimer, which means that you have two units that are identical and they assemble to form the dimeric active species. And we know from our experimental colleagues too that dimerization is important for catalysis. This is a cysteine protease, very well-known type of enzymes where what you have is a cysteine residue acting as a nucleophile. And you can see also here a histidine that is also catalytic activate, activating this nucleophile. So relatively well understood chemistry we thought at the very start, but actually there were many questions that started to appear that we thought that we knew from previous cysteine proteases, but it actually were not so clear. So the general chemistry that is happening in proteases is the following. Proteases will be splitting a peptide in the peptidic bond, and that will be possible through a nucleophile, in this case cysteine, and a histidine residue that will be activated in the nucleophile. You have first a nucleophilic attack, and the second step is the hydrolysis to regenerate the catalytic residues. And that has been studied in other proteases. But actually there were several questions that we have about the protonation state of that histidine because the pocket that where this is located is quite different to other proteases. We know that there have been uh, several efforts uh, to understand uh, computationally this system and we have generated different inhibitors, sorry, through computation here, uh, different inhibitors uh, uh, have been designed through computation 
One of the examples is the Pfizer compounds that is now in clinical trial. And the other inhibition efforts uh, helped through computation has been coming from Bill Jordanson at Yale University, has assigned these nanomolar inhibitors here. So we are interested more fundamentally in, in the following uh, system. We are interested in the natural substrate. So before going into the inhibitor design, we wanted to understand how naturally this enzyme is able to catalyze uh, their native substrate. And from that knowledge, uh, being able to design new inhibitors. So what we decided to do is analyze 11 sequences that will mimic the natural substrate. As I mentioned before, those chain are very, very long, but 11 substrate did allow us to test that experimentally. So these are the 11 ones shown here. And what we can see, we define as a P1, the residue where the bond is cut. So this is the P1 position. You see that in all cases, a glutamine is located here. And you see a pattern generally uh, while maintaining P2, you have a hydrophobic residue. In P4, you have a small residue that can change, but then at the extreme, you, say, you see uh, many more variations. And the pockets where this is located seems to be quite solvent exposed compared to other uh, proteases. And you can see here that is elongated. So it's very extended conformation. So in this side, we have the P prime and this, this side, we have the P side that we will be discussing um, in the following slides. So we have several questions to answer. The first one was the protonation state. Is the cysteine um, activated before the nucleophilic attack, meaning that this is an ion pair, or is the cysteine neutral uh, with, together with histidine? And that is very important for modeling because if we don't have the correct uh, protonation state, all our modeling will be uh, biased and may provide different uh, answers, as we have seen also. How are substrate recognized? We really wanted to understand how that was happening. Can we design sequences that bind more tightly? And finally, can we use this information to guide drug design? So to answer those questions, we're using a combination of different techniques, from docking to QMMM to experiments. And of course, we are unable to learn all these different techniques in such short period of time, but we're very likely to uh, be able to combine and join efforts with excellent colleagues around the globe. So we started to meet with people at Oxford, chemistry and statistics, but also Bristol, and later France, Spain, and Japan. So each of us has contributed with a small set of skills and knowledge. And during these two years, almost two years, we have been able to learn quite a lot from each other and the different techniques that we, we use. So the first question to answer was, do we have a a neutral on an iron per species. Both have been uh, suggested for normal uh, cysteine proteases. And our first task was to identify that, as well as to identify the protonation state of the different histidines. For people doing modeling, you may know that histidines are actually quite challenging to, to predict. And they are very, very important for the stability of the simulations. So Rebecca at the University of Bristol, together with Professor Adrian Mulholland, explored this using first very a tip methodology to identify the differences in energy and later higher level theory. You use usually a, a DFTP3 as a first test, but we know the challenges, especially with a C thing. Uh, we know that there are a biases and DFTP3 tends to overestimate proton affinities on those systems. So we did correct based on better quality DFT uh, level of theory, in both cases, we can identify that the ion pair is higher in energy, giving us confidence that in the presence of the soft rate, the neutral species is the uh, lowest energy species. After identifying that, we went to explore the binding of this system uh, to the enzyme. And we used two different methodologies. Rebecca at the University of Bristol was using interactive molecular dynamic with virtual reality. And Henry in our group was using classical molecular dynamics. 
we have been exploring uh, virtual reality ourselves and has been very interesting learning process. So what is happening with virtual reality is that you can really feel the forces on the system. So just by trying, and Rebecca has quite a lot of expertise, she was able to identify sites that were biting more strongly or more weakly, just through the feeling that she had of a, it, some of the atoms being more difficult to pull than others. So just from that a first experiment, she was able to identify that the P-prime residues were fluctuating much more, and the P-site residues were, able to, were more stable and more difficult to modify. Through classical simulation, we're also trying to quantify those interactions and compare our, can we use different methodologies and, and uh, obtain, uh, confirm the same, uh, the same conclusion or, or maybe challenge that. So to do that, we use classical uh, molecular dynamic simulation. In this case, Henry was analyzing the 11 different substrates and in each case, identifying the different interactions. I mentioned before, to the right is the P prime side and to this side, uh, to the left is the P side. We're able to identify three key uh, areas of hydrogen bond interactions. We're able to identify here a backbone interaction that is maintained in all the different substrates. So for all the substrates, you can see in dark blue, the hydrogen bonds that are the strongest. And you see that in the P1 region that is essential for recognition, all of them are weak, but you have many different ones. So you have five different hydrogen bond, hydro bonds really keeping the glutamine residue in place, which explains why you really have to have these hydrogen in, hydro bond interactions here. But it's not only hydrogen bond interactions that we have keeping the system together. We can identify other hydrophobic or van der Waals interaction in different sites. And one of the sites that is highly hydrophobic, as shown here, is the position of the P2. P2 seems to be very tight and hidden pocket, but actually we have identified that it's highly flexible. So if we see here, we have been analyzing plasticity using 300, more than 300 different crystal structures. We see that as the, in the S1 position where the glutamine is located, variations are very, very small. But actually at the S2 site, there seems to be very struggle and hidden. Actually, variations are very, very large between the different crystals. And that is very interesting because that will suggest that actually this pocket here is a very hidden pocket, but at the same time, very flexible and plastic. So which make a very nice druggable pocket for inhibitor design. That is a type of pocket that people will look, they would like to look for something that is hidden, but also give you flexibility to insert new uh, compounds uh, there. So with that analysis and um, another type of analysis that we were complementing, we're first able to identify key hydrogen bonds that are stable in all the different substrates. We're able to identify also that contact interactions, many of them hydrophobic in nature, are uh, more stable in the P side, while the P prime side, apart from this hydrogen bond interaction, doesn't have many contact interactions, and that is playing why it's so floppy. We're able to identify the S1 pocket here and the S2 as key target for inhibitor design because provide well-defined hydrophilic character or hydrophobic character in the case of S2, but also the plasticity that is necessary for design. So we're later exploring um, um, those peptides experimentally. Before doing this, we're using knowledge from COVID-1. From COVID-1, we knew that all these substrates were being uh, hydrolyzed uh, relatively efficient. Okay, so S1 was hydrolyzed very fast, while S5 and 7 were the slowest one. We know that there are some mutations between the two different uh, viruses, but we were able to identify that in fact, all of them are hydrolyzed by this uh, new virus. The pattern is relatively similar, but we see that actually the S2 uh, sequence is not, so which is shown here, is very slow. So it used to be very fast, but it's slow. And that happened through a mutation that is found here, coupled to also uh, the, this substrate too is the one that has most mutations across the different system. Some other sequences don't have any mutation at all. So we're able to identify through experiments run by TICA that all these substrate 
are a, a hydrolyzing, which is important because that will be our reference. We want to design new peptide inhibitors. So we really needed to know that the, the natural ones were being hydrolyzed. And how do we design new inhibitors here? So we are using computation for that. And that was a task uh, led by Debbie and Richard in, in Bristol um, and with help from, from the team here too. So what we have been doing in this case is using in silico saturation metagenesis. And what you do is you calculate the energy difference between the, the residue that you had before and the residue that you want to mutate. And we do that for each side. Remember that we have 11 different sites. So this was quite a task of exploring each substrate and each site. We knew that some of the sites going uh, towards the outside were less uh, stable. So we wanted to see if we could improve binding in those extremes. So this is just an example for the P2 site. So let's consider that we have substrate one. Substrate one was originally leucine, so we have zero. Anything that is positive means that the new residue binds more strongly than the previous one. And a red sign will mean that it binds more weakly. So we were competing for each of them, those. And you can see some of the residues that tend to be quite favorable in all cases. So you see that phenylalanine in most cases is very positive. Um, tryptophan and tyrosine. We also consider a amino acid that will tend to give an extended conformation and that we uh, will have a charge of plus one or zero because we didn't want it to affect too much the solubility that we already had. So in that case, we were able to identify, for example, that for P2 position, we have three residues that are interesting. We could mutate them to phenylalanine, we could mutate them to tryptophan or tyrosine. We didn't select tyrosine here because we have for one residue that was very negative. So based on this analysis, we're able to design a sequence of 11 uh, residues that generated new peptides. So we call them 12 to 60. And they are a completely new residues compared to the uh, old ones. And they were based in this analysis. So if we compare now the energy of the binding energies using as a reference alanine for all cases, you see that the new design compounds are predicted to be a stronger binders. Something that is very interesting here is also that if you see where the binding is stronger, you can see that here in the natural substrate, binding in the P prime side is very weak. So most of the energy that we see here is coming from the P side. As I mentioned before, the P side is much stronger. But what happened with the new designed peptides? Binding get much stronger, but actually it's because we are improving the binding in the P prime side. So we're able to, to make this prediction. We're very excited. And a few weeks, weeks after sending those sequences to our experimental colleagues were very stressful because we wanted to know how wrong we were. And maybe if we were wrong, start uh, analyzing our methodology. And if we were right, they really kind of celebrate and think what we can do with those uh, analysis. So experimentally, we identified that those residues bind they bind more strongly and they don't um, uh, undergo hydrolysis. So they are really inhibitors, competitive inhibitors. They are not in the nanomolar sign as we will expect for a drug-like molecule, but actually they inhibit in the uh, uh, micromolar range. So it's, it's a good starting point. We did some tests. So you, as you can identify, the P2 position has been interesting for us. And we saw that actually introducing tryptophan was a, a important in most of these new designs. So we wanted to see, is mutation at the P2 sign sufficient to block catalysis? So we took our residue one and just modified the position two. We knew that modifying position one will be a affecting hydrolysis and we saw no cleavage because we really need a glutamine or something similar that can mimic those hydrogen bonds. But actually blocking the P2 position with tryptophan led to partial cleavage. So that means that tryptophan hindered the catalytic binding, but it's not completely uh, making prohibited the, the cleavage. 
So there are some other residues that are acting, um, cooperating with a tryptophan for that to happen. So how are those residues acting? So from our analysis before was very much based on numbers, but we didn't have any physical information to know why tryptophan was leading to that inhibition. We know that it's partial, we know that there are other residues affecting, but it's affecting something if we introduce tryptophan there. But what we saw in this case that tryptophan can accommodate very easily in the pocket that I mentioned before. And, and that is interesting because we really needed to go for MD simulation. If you dock in, in that site, the dock post will not allow tryptophan to go because they, some of the crystal structure have a pocket that is very small. But if you allow for, allow for flexibility, you see that that pocket is highly flexible and allows to accommodate very nicely a tryptophan. But tryptophan is not always there, can move. And this is a simulation that we did uh, um, for a hundred of nanoseconds. And you can see there are different conformations. 33% of the time we saw that actually for a tryptophan is forming this type of pi pi stacking interaction and really affecting the orientation of the histidine. So our hypothesis is that histidine they, uh, is adopting a non-reacting conformation when tryptophan is acting here. It's not complete, but may be affecting that. So that has led us to suggest some uh, modifications in that tryptophan ring, introducing al alkyl or aryl groups that can be increasing uh, the non-covalent interactions uh, found here, but also introducing different substitutions around that can really allow us to expand these uh, hydrophobic interactions. So what do we do with that knowledge now? So we are exploring new uh, peptide inhibitors. We're really much interested in, in exploring a uh, cyclization as well on them. But also we wanted to see how we can relate that knowledge of the natural substrate to the new uh, substrate that are being uh, uh, released. And I don't know, you may be familiar uh, maybe with the COVID moonshot and the Fragalysis project. So those are projects where people from around the globe has been contributed with different molecular fragments from where new inhibitors have been suggested. Many of them has been tested and crystal structures are available for them. So we took those structures and started to analyze those molecular fragments that are expected to be good starting point for inhibition design. How do they behave? So we started to cluster them based on similarity indexes and compare the interactions that they have with the interactions that we saw in the natural substrates. We saw that cluster one was clustering all the covalent uh, fragments. So that was expected. They, they behave in a very similar manner. But cluster five was something that was quite interesting. They are non-covalent uh, inhibitors and they have similar interactions to the one that we saw in the natural substrate, especially with glutamic acid 166 and histidine 163. So we all uh, uh, we saw that six of these compounds that are the initial fragments for the sign behave in a very similar manner. We call those interactions these privileged interactions uh, that have both natural substrates and inhibitors. And again, we saw that a steel pocket can really accommodate many different functional groups. So uh, what we have seen now, so as I mentioned before, those fragments have been used for new design and to test uh, including inhibition a uh, design and crystal structure. So when comparing the system, we saw that those belonging to cluster five actually shown a, have shown a stronger binder. So they were all at least in the micromolar. So identifying those um, promising fragments as good binders can lead maybe to improve a binding affinities to the nanomolar um, range. So with that, I think that I can finally summarize the key finding that we have. We have many, many questions that we have not answered related to MPRO, but also to other non-structural proteins where we are trying to apply this methodology. But first, is uh, our conclusion was about the catalytic diet. Um, having a neutral catalytic diet is, is the most stable conformation, and that is important for catalysis. Otherwise, the reactive conformation is, is hindered. We identified the histidine protonation state is key for stability. And we tested each of them, identifying which one provide best stability. 
the positioning of the crystal waters is very important too, and retaining them is, is relevant to keep hydrogen bonding interactions network. When exploring natural substrate, we identify key hydrogen bond patterns at the different sites. We saw that the P site binds much more stronger than the P prime, which makes sense because the P prime is the one that will have the leaving uh, substrate. We identified two different uh, two pockets that are drogable. S1 is expected to be one of them, but actually S2 is a very promising one. And we're able to design peptide inhibitors that actually bind more tightly in the P prime side. So that is where promising designs may be coming. One of the suggestions has been cyclization leading to a later extended substrate, which may uh, facilitate a uh, permeation in, in the cell. So we have tested both natural and peptide inhibitors as I really validating our predicted um, design. And we have also been exploring those interactions in that in fragments that have been designed more recently. Identifying that using the interaction of the natural substrate really can guide the sign of new fragments and hopefully new drug inhibitors. So today we have vaccines that are helping us to, to keep healthy during this time, but designing new viral drugs remain important, especially because there are many different viruses that are related and may come in the future. So be prepared for those uh, aspects remain an important task. So, a research in, in antiviral a medicines is, is a key aspect that we should maintain and non stop as happened when the first SARS CoV a, a, a virus came. So, finally, very important for us has been open science. So, we are able to start our research by communicating online every Wednesday evening. We're able to communicate our results first in bioarchive, receiving feedback, and later in chemical science. We have been using open source a um, data set from the moonshot from the a uh, pdb database as enabled to access crystals a month before the publication has come so really has been a, an amazing time to show how important it is to keep open science so we have made all our results available our our models and data are available in github as well so hopefully others can use our designs so finally, I would like to thank uh, all the people that has been contributing to this work. Uh, being in lockdown has been very difficult, but actually having those Wednesday evening meeting, discussing science, techniques, and learning from each other has been um, um, very, very important to keep the spirit out and, and to really do better science that we're not be able to do alone. We're able to, for example, if we publish all our data in one single paper, it was a big task to write, but actually we felt that the, 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 the sum of them was, was much better than, than the independent uh, contribution from each of us. So we're very, very happy to, to make new friends and collaborators during this time. And thanks to all of you uh, for listening. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. And just so, Thanks all the people in our group that has been listening about COVID, something that we didn't know before uh, COVID came to, to our life. So they have been very, very uh, nice contributing with feedback in that project. And we have a position being open with the Scofield and the Duarte group arising from those interactions that came during COVID. So very happy to, to discuss um, with people that may be interested in joining us. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Fernanda. Very interesting, very exciting, and, and a very noble effort to, to drop your ongoing research to tackle such a huge problem that is relevant to, to all of us, to, to the world. Uh, we have uh, time for, for questions, and we have two from YouTube. If I may, I'm going to read those first. Um, on, on the Zoom platform, please raise your hand, and we'll... Uh, uh, We'll give you the microphone in order. Uh, so Flavia Clemente from YouTube asks, what is the expressed scissors that contributes to SARS-CoV-2 cleavage? The express, sorry? The expressed scissors. Uh, sure. Yeah, so, so the scissor that I was mentioning before is is M pro. So M pro is, is acting as a scissor by for itself. 
how is doing that at the first point we don't know because one of the questions that we have is for example m pro is a scissor and need to be a dimer but before cutting itself will be a monomer so is something else helping to to generate the first cutting before coming coming a dimer so m pro is acting as a scissor that we have that will cut everything including itself so it's like me win together in a line with many people and I have to separate myself from the others before starting separating the other ones. How that first step is happening is something that we, we, don't, we don't know at, at this point. Um, we'll be, uh, and we are also thinking about, can we design not, not only these short sequences, but really the polyprotein itself at the stage where we have the whole system? Is that helping to, to provide the interactions for that? That answer the question. Thank you. We have another uh, question from, from YouTube, Alfredo Quevedo from Cordoba, Argentina. Thank you, Dr. Duarte, for the great presentation. Question, what tool was used to dock the peptides to MPRO? If we were using Autodoc for that, that is mostly because Garrett Morris is, is developing Autodoc uh, there. So we, we were mostly using that, but we also tested with gold just to, to make sure that our, and, and for each, of the, of the computation that we did, we were using two different methodologies just to make sure that, that our results were not affected by the type of scoring function that we were using and so on, yeah. So we were uh, building um, the dog process uh, for the peptide, we we're building them in based on crystal structure and for the inhibitors, we we're using autodoc uh, directly. And something very interesting that there was, uh, having validation. So having good crystal was very important to validate the methodology that we were using for docking. So making sure that something that binds and that doesn't bind can be predicted with the tool. So I, that is very important to keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, is there any other question here on Zoom? If not, then, uh, oh, now we have one, uh, another one on YouTube. Angie Forero Giron from Chile and Colombia. Or there is a Chile population in Colombia. I, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, thanks so much. Great presentation. How can the inhibitors be inserted in the vaccine? Yeah. Well, firstly, yeah, and we are very well in Chile. We're very lucky to have a, a very nice um, a community of, of, of people from Colombia. So I'm adding that and it's, it's from the group. Um, so the peptide inhibitors will be more thinking of antiviral drug design. That um, the the way that the, the current uh, vaccines work is is a, a different type of technology uh, from from the current point of view. So it's it will be not a the inhibition. So this will be more in the in the antiviral drug side of of things than than the vaccines that are being developed currently. So there will be kind of complementary approaches, hopefully, to tackle um, the same virus. Right, and developing antibodies in the way that the, the vaccine is working currently. Thank you, very interesting. It's fascinating. Uh, any other question? We still have some time. Uh, yes, Liliana Quintanar, please go ahead. Hola, Fernanda, great talk. Um, I, I had written my question in the chat and then somehow my computer failed. So I was out for two minutes. I don't know if they wow. asked the question, but it's about how would you envision delivering these peptide inhibitors and also like trespassing, you know, or avoiding proteolysis in the, you know, while they're being delivered. Yeah. Yeah, that has been a talent and our dream, and I'm very ignorant in this area. Some of the things that I, I still keep to learn is, could we have something like cyclic compound or something that can, even with light, for example, if you could bring this cyclic compound stable, even with something that is not a peptide, but can be a mimic, a non-native like amino acid. If you can have that and with, with like, or with another type of side reaction, just activate that to be extended. Um, that is one of the things that I have been 
thinking will be interesting. Uh, if that can be applicable to that is something that we still don't know. Um, doesn't need to be the full peptide there because as yeah, we know that any peptide sequence will be hydrolyzed by other proteases. So we really don't want that. But if we can at least mimic those interactions with some peptide-like drugs, and some of the drugs are, for example, in cluster five, many of them have a peptide-like bond in between. So that could be a way to, to uh, hydrolyze. Microcycle-like compounds have been becoming quite popular, cyclic compounds, but how to activate them in situ, that will be something very interesting. Uh, but where I kind of find learning kind of the jump between where we learn computationally and how we make that uh, practice. Cool, cool. I was wondering now that you mentioned that activating by by proteolytic cleavage, like could it be actually activated by the MPRO itself? Like yeah, so yeah. Oh, well, Chris has been uh, dreaming on that side, Chris Coppola, and, and um, yeah, thinking that that will be an idea to to try to to have an easy to activation there. Um, yeah, but yeah, that would be very very exciting. O other areas that we are considering is. We're using uh, knowledge that we have from um, beta-lactams and other antibiotics also, mm -hmm. testing them here um, in, in a way that, yeah, could those scaffolds also be used and combined because they have been used with many serin and cysteine proteases before. So, yeah. yeah, and my last question, if I can, um, have, have you looked also into applying these, um, you know, computational methodologies to look for inhibitors between the, you know, to inhibit the binding of the spike protein with the AC2 enzyme? We haven't looked at that enzyme, but we have been looking at other non-structural proteins more recently. And, and again, just because crystals are coming uh, there and we can do the analysis, so we really want to do the same analysis uh, because some of the sequences are very similar of, of the peptides that they can create and some of this uh, other NSP uh, uh, proteins that are coming. So we're working currently in, in a group of them. Okay, great. Thank you, Fernanda. Very nice work. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. Uh, anybody else? Luis Medina has a, a question here in the chat. He says, Excellent talk and project, Dr. Fernanda. My question, do you envision collaborations with pharmaceutical companies to move the project forward to the clinic? I think that that is a necessary step. Uh, even right now, I mean, the interactions that have been generated during these last two years have shown that it's very important that from the vaccine side and fundamental science, so many of the peptides that we've been testing and the experiments have been contributed because some of the compounds have come from, from, from them and just facilitating knowledge exchange. So I think that um, definitely anything that we want to develop need to have the interaction between academia and, and industry. Yeah. And, and, and this year have shown that there are possibilities for that. Even now we are discussing and sometimes if you want to suggest a compound, we all try to look for who can get that. And, and really industry has been very kind in, in trying to contribute as much as they can if, if they come from the chemistry point of view, because sometimes it's synthesis, sometimes it's expression of the proteins, sometimes it's testing. So um, all, all this part is very important. And, and I think industry has a role to play in all of them. Yeah, this point okay. can try it so far, but if we can get an understanding of what is happening and develop compounds that can help to understand the process, that will really be, be something that, that will be very proud of. Gabriel Merino wrote in, in the chat, uh, this is a very complete work. Both reviewers commented that it was one of the best articles they have reviewed. It is difficult to handle an article like this, but it's an example of how can we go from a theoretical approach to very specific drug design. And he says, uh, thank you for choosing chemical science to publish it. No, no, thanks. Thanks for keeping us because we're very afraid. There are, there are word limits in many journals and really that push out, out uh, some limitations in open science. We have some funding that really require that. And, and chemical sciences allow us, and it allow us to keep the work as a, as a whole uh, that we really wanted to, to, to 
push for that by end up having a couple of papers, but less that good. Thanks all for that. Yes, the rapid dissemination of, of uh, information has been key in, in tackling uh, COVID. Well, I think that's uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you very much, Fernanda, for your for your great talk, and thank you everybody for for being here and attending these two wonderful talks we had today at Latinx Camp. Uh, well, tomorrow we have two the final two lectures by uh, professors Hoffman and, and Marcus. So we hope to see you all there. Uh, once again, thank you to our presenters today, and thank you very much, everybody, for, for attending. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.